Thank you. All right. Well, it's seven o'clock. So why don't we get started before Richard and Hugh cheat and ask more substantive questions before your presentation? <laughs> um, okay. I, I just have a, a few quick questions, but first of all, um, Rainbow, thank you for coming and, and thank everybody who's here for coming um, to attend Sustainable Claremont's Dialogue Series, our longest running series and, and one of my favorites. Um, it's always good to see everyone on a Monday night. Um, Quick few announcements. Um, all of these will be in the description of the video if you're watching it on YouTube, or I could pop them in the chat box um, after I finish sharing my screen. Uh, the first announcement is that we are going to be holding our annual garden tour again, hopefully this year, this spring. Um, and we're looking for uh, a couple more gardens to showcase. If you or somebody you know um, lives in Claremont and wants to showcase your garden um, for the Garden Club's garden tour, um, please feel free to reach out to us. So you can reach out to me, Stuart at sustainableclaremont.org or to my colleague, Han. And again, I'll drop their uh, emails in the chat box, but you get to see it's outreach at sustainableclaremont.org. Um, we also have some uh, Sustainable Claremont swag left. So we have some t-shirts, some hoodies, some totes, hats, stickers, magnets, all sorts of things. So if you want to deck out your office or yourself with some good Sustainable Claremont stuff, um, I'll, you can follow the link um, and I'll put that again in the um, description on the video and in the chat box in just a minute here. Um, quick thing about, or quick uh, announcement about our topic tonight, uh, air quality. So air pollution and air quality have always been something that Sustainable Claremont you know, cares deeply about. Uh, when I first came on to Sustainable Claremont five years ago, one of the first uh, big new initiatives that we took on was a clinic program with Harvey Mudd. Um, and what we were doing with that program is we were working with student researchers to identify how um, the idle line, the line of idling cars at student pick up and drop off, um, you know, led to, you know, polluted air for the children who are walking to and from school every single day, right? And how the heat interacts with that. Um, how it interacts with the young developing lungs. Um, so very important. Unfortunately, that was sidetracked because of COVID. Um, but even since then, you know, our tree planting initiatives, uh, a large part of that is due to helping clean up air pollution, right? We try to plant next to freeways we, when we can. We try to pl plant up parks that are next to major um, corridors. And so this is an important area um, for Sustainable Claremont. So Rainbow, when you reached out to us um, and offered to, to you know, give this presentation, it was um, timely and uh, something I was excited to hear more about. So um, Rainbow is our speaker, Rainbow Young. She's a senior, senior public affairs specialist at the South Coast Air Quality Management District. Um, and she's got a great presentation lined up for us. And I'm going to stop talking so we have more time for your presentation, Rainbow, and I'm going to let you share your screen in just a second here. Okay. So while I'm waiting to share my screen, first of all, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Wood, and also uh, sustainable uh, uh, Claremont members. And let me share a screen here. Okay, so this is my PowerPoint. Um, all right, so I am going to share my screen. But before I start, um, I'd like to um, I'd like to uh, uh, give a you know a quick um, uh, introduction of myself. So, uh, well, my name is easy to remember, and I've been with the district for um, well, almost twenty three years. So, I started in two thousand one, and then uh, I have been a geographic representative for different parts of the region. Uh, and in recent years, mainly the San Gabriel Valley area plus uh, part of the San Fernando Valley area. And this area of 34 cities um, on our uh, map jurisdiction is the LA County Eastern Region cities. And, uh, the, and the board member uh, covering representing your area uh, is our vice chair, uh, Cacioli, Michael Cacioli. And he's also a councilman uh, in South Pasadena. He is um, a strong advocate for air quality and, and also you know, for uh, clean transportation as well. Um, so uh, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the air quality um, 
uh, progress, uh, challenges, and uh, different programs. And then I'm going to start share um, my PowerPoint screen, and then we'll go to switch over to our website because our website has lots of information, good information, useful information for the community to apply or, you know, just, uh, you know, also also for, um, for the education for the students as well. So I'm going to start with this PowerPoint and please stop me if you have any questions, but um, we do have a, you know, quick um, uh, Q&A uh, after this uh, presentation before I go to the website. Um, okay, so first, um, let me see. So some quick background on the South Coast uh, AQMD and our region. Um, so we cover a pretty large area, large portions of LA, San Bernardino, Riverside, and all of Orange County. And as you can see on the left of the um, uh, slide here, um, actually, we are almost uh, 50 years old, so it's, um, <laughs> I, I, I guess we're going to celebrate. So uh, it took effect in 1996, and there was a petition by residents demanding clean air to protect um, their health. So that's what that's where the, that's the origin um, when we were uh, created. And we, we our um, air district, we represent 70 million people. Uh, we will be the fifth largest state after New York and before Pennsylvania, according to the census in uh, 2022. And um, a lot of businesses, they are subject to our rules and regulations, about 28,000 uh, in our region. And 67% um, of the um, EJ communities, I'm sure you know EJ environmental justice, are in the state re, um, reside within our four county region. So, so environmental justice, justice, the concept of EJ is big uh, in our policy making. And then I'll explain in a little bit. And also we, uh, we know that we cover uh, the twin ports, the port of LA and port of Long Beach which are the two ports actually are, are process about one third of the um, US uh, um, uh, cargo. So which means uh, about one third of the uh, goods, the cargoes coming into the United States um, go through our two ports. So that's why when we present our situation, let's say to the federal government, we say, hey, it's not fair. Uh, we, we, want a, we want a level playing field because you know, we are the recipients of all these uh, pollution from the ports and then from the corridor of the um, goods movement. Uh, and then these goods actually, they go to the rest of the country as well. Um, so this is uh, one big source of our uh, pollution. And then actually there's good news. Um, I'm, yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt really quick. Um, would it be possible to to share um, the slide on the screen uh, to make it bigger? I think we can see your um, your previous slide, and I think for some of us oh, who are you know what I I don't know why it comes like that because you know um, uh, if you can't make the change. It's okay. I just thought I'd you know let, what? You... let me let me see let me see how I should make the change. Um, how do I do it? Do you know how do I do it? Um, you know, are you, is this PowerPoint you're sharing on? Uh, let's see. I'm the wrong person to ask this. Um, um Hugh, do you know? Yeah. If, if you, um, the icons that are underneath the slide on the left, you should be, able, one of those should go to the, um, yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the. The one to the right of the search button. I think they will take it to the presentation mode. Oh, uh, not this oh, one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that was not the right one. Um, uh, How about one just over rainbow? Not uh, the kind of middle one with the screen looks like it's split in half. Hmm. Well, shoot. How about that one? Um, you know what? I don't know why it, you know, it. I don't know why this screen becomes like that. It's usually not like that. 
Uh, let's see. If you go to the um, display settings at the top, right where it says show taskbar and then display settings. Mm -hmm. What happens if you click on display settings above the slide? Mm -hmm. um, do you see where I'm talking about? At the upper left hand of your screen, it says show taskbar and then it says display settings. Oh, um, up at the very top of the screen. There we go. And, Let me see. Uh, well, yeah, this is good. Yeah, no, if you we, we see it. Yeah, that's if you the want best. To do it this way, or if you want to do, um, Lilia, can you read it this way? What happens if you yes, click on? Yes, I think on... this works, Stuart, because yeah. at least it works. Yeah, we could stick with this. If this works for you, Rainbow. Oh. oh, OK, so let me see. What did I do here? Now it's gone back to the previous version. Sorry, Rainbow, I should have mentioned this earlier. Because it wasn't like right that when we tested it, right? Down. No. Um, Why don't you end the slideshow and can we just go through the normal slides on the PowerPoint that you had like that and just scroll like down? This one? Yeah, is that okay? Those are, those are much bigger, much easier to see and read. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I, you know what? I I don't I don't know why it, it wasn't like that when we tested it, right? No, it wasn't. But this okay. this works for me, and hopefully everybody else too can read them. Yes, better. you can see this is more legible than the previous one. Okay, uh -huh. so uh, I'm sorry about that. No, okay, no, so it happens to all of us, so it's okay. Okay, all right, so can you still see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, the good news about um, the uh, air quality um, is that, you know, the air pollution and cancer-causing air toxics uh, have significantly declined. Uh, in fact, based on the scientific study uh, by the AQMD, uh, the cancer risk declined from um, 2012 to 2018 by roughly 50%. And uh, we are in the process of doing the, um, the next uh, maze, uh, which you know, uh, referred to the multiple air toxic exposure study. So uh, this is good news. Um, but the bad news is, um, we still have a long way to go to meet the federal uh, health-based uh, air quality standards. Uh, and the largest contributor of air pollution are the mobile sources like ships, planes, uh, off-road uh, equipment, uh, heavy duty trucks and trains. So these are the sources, they are the, mostly the federal store sources or the state sources. We have very limited uh, authority on these uh, sources. So we've also, it's like over 80% of the uh, our air pollution in the region comes from the mobile sources. And then, uh, as you know, you are all aware of the um, impact of uh, air pollution to our health. Now, ozone is also known as smog. And then that's the pollution that makes our, you know, air look uh, brown and causes our eyes to burn and sometimes makes it harder to breathe. And then, you know, PM, we have the PM10 and PM2.5 uh, particular matter. And PM2.5 is extremely fine dust. Uh, it won't, it goes into your lung and it won't um, expel. So, and then that's the most um, uh, unhealthy uh, that really impacts our health. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then the P long exposure to PM2.5 has been linked to like premature death and particularly in people who have chronic heart or lung diseases and reduced lung function growth uh, in children as well. And um, now air pollution, I mentioned that has uh, adverse uh, health impacts, especially on children, including low birth rate, asthma and lung diseases. And um, there are so many studies that are linked um, uh, to the different impacts of air pollution. And there are greater impacts uh, in on our environmental justice communities, our EJ communities, who are disproportionately impacted by goods movement freeways and busy freeways, uh, busy roadways, industrial facilities, and other sources of unhealthy emissions. Now, all these, <clears throat> all these uh, air pollution health impacts uh, also translate into real costs, um, real costs of uh, 
uh, for the society. For instance, the premature uh, uh, deaths, the hospitalizations, and um, the asthma has also become the uh, children's hospital admission, the first uh, uh, course for children's hospital admission in Southern California. And then uh, also costs like um, uh, work and school uh, lost days and also uh, like health um, uh, hosp hospitalization costs as well. Now, um, this is the, um, the slide that uh, you probably uh, uh, asked about earlier. So as you know, air pollution has been um, uh, handled by different bodies. Like for us, uh, we, we are South Coast AQMD. There are different AQMDs throughout California, like uh, for, the, for instance, San Diego AQMD, uh, San Joaquin AQMD, Bay Area AQMD, uh, Sacramento AQMD. There are different AQMD. I mean, we are one of the, uh, the largest or the, the dirtiest. And then the state is the CARB, California Air Resources Board, which is the uh, body under the governor's administration. So we report to CARB and in turn report to US EPA. And of course, US EPA is under the federal government. And um, so the CARB, we have the major, uh, so we have a governing board um, uh, and then they, we are a regulatory body. So we make rules and regulations for um, the region, uh, but mainly on the stationary resources. Uh, for the mobile sources, like the sources I mentioned, like trucks, planes, ships, etc., they um, they they are the major jurisdiction under CARB and US EPA. And I mentioned earlier, um, we sued uh, US EPA for not doing enough. Um, and uh, last, and then we have a plan. Uh, we called for the US EPA to use um, its unique authority to reduce emissions from federal uh, sources. And, uh, but then they disapproved, um, well, at least a draft decision um, last Friday and we issued the press release. So, so I'm looking at my e uh, press release right now. So basically the action proposes to um, disapprove our plan to meet the 1997 federal ozone standard and uh, our plan actually called for US EPA to use its unique authority to reduce emissions from federal sources. And um, the reason why, because you know, more than 80% of the smog forming emissions of the, in the South Coast region are from mobile sources. And um, we already have the strictest um, regulations in the nation on stationary sources. So, because I mean, all these years, uh, the last 30, 40 years, the businesses they have been cooperative, you know, technology and incentives. We have tried different, uh, uh, um, like different methods, different methodologies. And um, and then we have already achieved over 90% of uh, uh, reductions from the stationary sources. There, there is not much we can do from the stationary sources. So that's why we have been trying to work with the, um, like different bodies, including US EPA, trying to, uh, have them do more on the uh, federal um, sources. Um, and we have jointly um, put in place the most innovative regulations in the nation to address mobile sources emissions. And now, you know, we thought that the US EPA has failed to rein in emissions under their control. So uh, I am not sure what the next step is uh, after we release the, um, uh, press release on Friday. I think we continue to work with them. Uh, the decision is a proposed one. It's not final finalized yet. So there will be a lot of like um, uh, efforts, um, you know, trying to work it out. Uh, but if, if they do not support what we think, they should have a um, higher uh, they should do more to on to reduce emissions from the uh, federal sources, there are a lot of us, there may be sanctions and also a lot of impacts, uh, not just to our health, but also to our economy as well. As you can see here from, for the stationary sources, you know, there we may increase a lot on their permit fees because the, the, the businesses, when, when they have equipment or their operations require, I mean, that at least uh, air, they are subject to our rules and regulations and there are permits. <clears throat> Or, or other costs, and then we may be forced to increase, you know, the fees largely. 
okay, that would be one of the impacts, you know, if the if the federal government is not going to do more and we cannot meet the uh, clean air standard. Um, and another one is, you know, we may lose like millions of dollars on the highway funding. And then another thing is, you know, they may come to um, give us a plan. Hey, you guys, South Coast AQ AQMD, you cannot meet the federal clean air standard. Um, then I'm going to give you a plan. Or maybe they may um, uh, require uh, people to drive on alternate days. And then the other days, you know, don't drive, something like that. So we don't want this to happen. But there's a dilemma because um, over 80% of the um, emissions come from the mobile sources. But we have very limited authority, you know, on those mobile sources is the federal government. So uh, it is, uh, I hope I'm not confusing you, but the, the dilemma is, is kind of, you know, um, is a, one of our biggest challenges. Okay, so our overall strategy is to, uh, like I said, you know, work with different bodies and also legislature. Uh, as a matter of fact, my boss, you know, uh, is going to lead our legislative team um, to go to Washington DC, um, I think tomorrow, this week. Uh, we always um, have a, um, we have consultants in, in uh, DC and also in Sacramento. We work with them directly. Uh, we try to achieve emissions reductions through the legislature as well. The legislations we sponsor, or I mean, it could be something like um, uh, achieve more funding for our incentive programs or, or rules and regulations that make emissions standards more stringent, something like this. So we work <clears throat> with our legislative team um, uh, closely to achieve emissions reductions uh, from both uh, the stationary sources and also the uh, mobile sources. So we continue to do that. And then uh, we put a lot of em emphasis on the R&D, the research and development. And, um, and then the main focus is the uh, zero emission technology. As you can see, uh, especially in recent years, uh, a lot of our um, investment uh, in technology uh, focus on the zero emission uh, strategies. And these are some of the examples of the zero emission truck uh, projects. Uh, the battery electric projects, uh, like um, the last two years with the Volvo Lights, the Jesse, um, and then also the fuel cell projects, we have Hyundai and Sunlight Transit. So, um, so, so there, there are different projects and heavy duty vehicles, um, like uh, to clean up the, you know, the trucks, and also different types of uh, heavy duty vehicles. And then there are commercial and city incentive uh, programs. And um, there are so many programs, uh, the, the cities, uh, the local municipalities, county um, and uh, uh, businesses, community members, they can uh, take advantage. Uh, one of them is the uh, commercial um, uh, landscaping uh, equipment. So we are offering a program like, um, uh, so if the commercial gardens and landscapers, uh, they wanted to change to their equipment from diesel to electric, you know, we offer up to 85% discount. So, and then the, but then they have to scrap it. They, and that's the gist of the program, right? Uh, and then the state actually a while back, uh, they have a program, uh, to help them as well. But then um, they don't, so the gardeners and landscapers, they don't have to scrap it. They don't have to turn in the equipment, but then the, the uh, discount is smaller. So our, ours is like the discount is bigger, but then they have to scrap the equipment, equipment to turn in their uh, uh, dirty equipment. And then this program is open to not just uh, landscapers, uh, commercial gardeners and landscapers, but also to cities to school districts, uh, to nonprofit organization, to colleges as well. So this is one of the programs and we still have the funding. And then we also have different programs to help uh, you know, achieve emissions reductions, uh, mainly in the mobile sources and in other sources other than stationary sources. And then th there, there are some residential incentive programs. Um, for instance, you know, the clean uh, furnace, um, you can uh, you know get up to fifteen hundred uh, for furnace rebate program, 
and then uh, electric lawnmower. So these are for residential uh, residents. Um, so res if you have a, a, a like um, a gasoline powered mower, you, you want to turn in for electric one, uh, we give you a rebate up to $250. Uh, depending on the model uh, or the size you buy. And this is an annual program. And then we have another one, uh, EV charger, residential. And But I think recently we have um, uh, limited to this program uh, for low income uh, communities. And then also the last one is replace your ride. So replace your ride is, as you can tell, if you have an old vehicle, I remember it's like 2008 or beyond, uh, before that. So you can replace a vehicle um, with a cleaner, uh, new cleaner version. And then we give you the uh, rebates up to 9,500. And this incentive is going to increase up to $12,000 in a few months. And then I'll, I'll go to the website and explain a little bit uh, uh, in, a, in a minute. And this replace your ride, you know, not also applies to uh, mobile uh, options. For instance, transit passes and also apply to uh, e-bike. So if you're interested in buying an e-bike, this one also applies. So um, we have other services to protect um, people's health. Uh, for instance, we have a small business assistance uh, hotline, um, bilingual staff, you know, we basically help the businesses to comply with our rules and regulations. Because uh, our purpose is not to give them a ticket, our purpose is to help them to comply with our rules and regulations. We even go out to help on site to give them a consultation. Um, and we have a complaint hotline and I'll talk about complaint in a minute as well. 1-800-CAT-SMOK, if you see a smoking vehicle on the freeway, uh, call us. You know, we, uh, first we need the driver's, uh, uh, we need the license number and uh, we send them a letter, a warning letter. Um, and then we have the uh, free mobile app and the app is very useful. So you can know your air quality information right at your uh, fingertip and you can uh, file air quality complaints from the app as well. And also, for instance, if you have an EV or a natural gas car, uh, you, uh, you know there's a charging map. So where to find those uh, uh, charging stations. And then also we have about 40 um, uh permanent um, air, uh, air monitoring stations throughout our four county region. So I think the one closest to yours is in Pomona. So, and then we also have the small mobile ones, for instance, for, um, for wildfires, we deploy the uh, mobile one as well. Um, like for San Gabriel Valley, there's the, for permanent monitoring stations, there's one in Pomona, there's one in Pasadena. So at different, different uh, regions. And we have a laboratory, a lab in our in our uh, headquarters in Diamond in Diamond Bar. So uh, all these monitoring stations they send the data uh, to our lab and we process them, and then and then we send this information, you know, to the to to different sources. So um, uh, for instance, to schools as well, and um, and you know, for 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 like organizations that subscribe that. Uh, request our information on air quality data. And also we have a free sensor um, uh, educational kit uh, too for the public to learn about the low cost sensor, air quality um, uh, monitoring sensor, because uh, these sensor are uh, in recent years, they become available to the uh, low cost to the, uh, to the public. But we, we set up a center basically to evaluate the per performance of this um, low cost sensor and to let people know, um, you know, the different the information about this uh, low cost sensor. So uh, this is, yes, yes. Do you have a question? Okay, so this is my last slide before I, you know, walk you through to our uh, web pages. So in short, the takeaway message is, you know, health impacts are severe, technological solutions are available, and we st we work with different government uh, bodies um, to achieve emissions reductions. And then stuff, you know, the general public can do is to download our app, you know, file a complaint. Or, you know, uh, there are so many things people can do to help clean the air when you are on the edge 
uh, I mean, on the verge of, uh, uh, for, uh, on the fence of uh, buying a clean air car, just go for it, you know, uh, like this is one, this one of the, uh, one of the things people can do to help clean the air. And uh, also you can join us as well. And then um, I'm going to stop share before I go to um, other, uh, and other web pages. So do you have a question? If not, then I, I'm going to share the other uh, information on our website, and then we can have more Q&A too. Yeah, Rainbow, I think Bob has a question in the comments. It says, is the Diamond Bar Lab affiliated with SEMA? SEMA? Am I saying um, that right? Maybe it's not S-E-M-A. It doesn't ring my bell. SEMA is the Specialty Equipment Manufacturers Association Automotive Related. No, I don't think so. This is this is our this is the lab at our headquarters. Yeah, this is AQMD lab. And yes, yes, Hugh. Thank you. Yeah. Um I just as you were talking about the various sources of air pollution, it it made me think about the proliferation of warehouses in the Inland Empire, which is sort of smack dab in the middle of the air quality district. I'm just wondering if there's been any kind of research or quantification of what impacts that's had on the air quality. And, you know, then I guess the associated question is, are there restrictions or incentives or things being done to um, maybe even in the entitlement process when they're being built to kind of restrict what types of transportation they use to, to contribute? Yes. Uh, well, um, the source uh, regarding warehouse, uh, we call it ISR, indirect source rules. So we adopted uh, rules related to warehouses, um, like I think last year or the year before last year. And then there are different sources as well. And right now we are dealing with indirect source um, rules uh, related to marine ports. So um it was in the news, you know, and, and as you can tell, you know, some the warehouse businesses, they may not like it, but we adopted the rules uh, to protect people's health, especially like you said, in the Inland Empire, a lot of warehouses. And then I can show you that, you know, we have um, a web page on our website uh, on warehouses. There are, in, uh, there, are, there, are, there are, we have so many resources to help them, uh, like, um, for instance, and then there are the, the rules, are, you know, there are different phases of rules. And then we try to adopt the rules in different phases to help the businesses. So I can show you on our website too. It's, it's, it's like sea of information. Thank you for your question. That is a good question. Yes, Richard. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I wonder if you could give us an example of um, a mobile source that CARB cannot regulate, but the federal EPA can? Uh, I think the planes, the planes. Ah, uh, yeah. The planes and, yeah. And then uh, I think for the uh, trains, for the trains, um, it's mainly federal source. I think CARB has a, uh, I'm not quite sure on that one, but then like, uh, for instance, the um, international, uh, the cargo ships, like the, those ships from China, uh, we need the help from the uh, US uh, EPA too, especially uh, those related to the international or like national. Um, they are more like the federal sources. Got it. Yeah, yeah, I, I see immediately that would be a big source. Yes, yes. I sort of forgot about the planes and the trains. <laughs> yeah, and then the trains because, uh, yeah, well, you know, because, you know, it's related to the interstate commerce. So uh, it's sophisticated as well. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm going to share screen and to walk you through some of our, you know, good web pages here. Can you see our AQMD um, webpage? Okay, great. Okay, so this is aqmd.gov. 
um, I would suggest that you bookmark it. It's a lot of information. So I I I open all these bookmarks so that you know I can go it go through it quickly. So as you can tell, so we have the rebate incentives, uh, air quality. You can check the air quality, how to file a complaint, and then FIND facilities facility information detail, and I'll show you in a minute. And um, all this good information. And then there's a map, you can check the air quality. So I'll go one by one. Now, uh, I'm not sure if you have ever tried to, uh, uh, try to get the air quality information from our uh, web or from the app. This, um, as you know, in summer, a lot of the schools, especially the soccer coaches, uh, they also they 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 like to go onto this and check the air quality information because they they use this information to determine whether they should have the soccer practice. <laughs> if it's in a very hot, uh, you know, smog or very bad uh, smog days, uh, or maybe during wildfire, they wanted to know how bad the air quality is and whether the school should stay open or the PE should continue to, you know, uh, 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 or cancel. Um, so it's very simple. Uh, so what's the, what's the zip code in Claremont? Nine? 91711. Okay, so, so Claremont. You know what, I, uh, we like the rain, as you can tell, most of the region is green. Because usually, you know, on a rainy day or or after rainy day, our air quality is usually better because we need the rain or the wind to disperse the air pollutants. So, uh, so Claremont is in green, so we have good good air quality. Uh, but if you check, let's say, uh, on a, uh, you know, after the rain or on a summer day, you know, sometimes you will see like red or or orange, and you know, not today is a good one. You know, most of <laughs> most of the uh, most of it is green, but you rarely see most of them is green. Um, okay, so this is about air quality. Okay, so this is the app I talked about, and then it's very useful information. So you can, you know, find from um, uh, Apple Store or Google Play. Okay, so now this is the air quality AQ spec, air quality sensor performance evaluation center. So we have a video to show you what that is. So basically, this is uh, our effort to inform the general public about the actual performance of the commercially available low cost air quality sensors. So we have all this information and also a, uh, I think we also let people to borrow uh, uh, if they have a project. Uh, we, we have loaned this to some of the um, schools or some of the organizations, they have projects, little projects to uh, measure air quality in their area. Um, so uh, we, we, we have all these uh, uh, evaluation uh, efforts, the performance evaluation to help the public understand this uh, low cost sensor. Um, okay, so complaints, our 800 cut smog hotline, we also have a Spanish uh, uh, complaint hotline as well. We have a video to walk people through, you know, if they file a complaint, how we, um, how we uh, process the complaint. So uh, it's very easy to report just 800 cut smog number. Uh, is, and then also you can also file a complaint online uh, or from the app as well. And this will walk people through, you know, how air quality complaints can be handled. So if you, if you sit in your home and then smell something fun, funny from outside, it could be like, you know, some odor or something from, Maybe a gas um gas gas station or auto body shop or spray booth something like that. You can file a complaint, and then we um send air quality inspectors out. But we usually will would like to um see like a pattern of complaints. So let's say um if if you and your neighbors they also smell or experience the same thing, have your neighbors also call so. We how so how fast and how fast or how frequent we send the inspectors out depend on also the urgency and also the number of complaints. 
All right. So uh, this is how people can file the complaint online. And then you can also attach a uh, video as well if you want. Now, this is facility information details. So um, our database uh, about the businesses, um, we make it open for the public to search. So uh, so if you want to know, let's say a, a factory or an industry or business uh, in your neighborhood, uh, whether they have complied with our rules and regulations, uh, whether they have received a notice of violation, their compliance history, everything is it's almost real real time. I think maybe just a few days or maybe uh just one week uh behind. Uh, but it's almost it's pretty up to date. So you can just uh click uh search here. And then input the the facility information and then you can uh you know click search and then the information will be there. Now check before you burn. I'm not sure. Um, so have you have you heard about this program? Okay, so we have adopted this rule quite some years back, but uh, every year we all we do outreach to remind the public or also through the media to let people know this program is in place. So basically, um, uh, this is a program. Uh, actually is a rule that we adopted quite some years back and uh uh from the start from november 1st to the end of february so we still have a few weeks to go so this program will be in place meaning that if we issue no burn alerts uh residents they are not allowed to burn woods no matter it's inside your house or outside there are exemptions for instance, you know, like uh, people uh, for for households, uh, you know, rely on uh, burning wood as their sole source of heat or for like people living uh, above certain uh, height in the mountain. There are some exemptions, but in general, so people are not allowed to burn wood on the days when we issue the no burn alerts. And when are we going to issue the no burn alerts? And then we, based on our forecast, so let's say if we forecast tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, the PM 2.5 becomes unhealthy, will reach the unhealthy level. So we will we will issue the no burn alerts, and and you know what? It depends on the on the um on the weather, and then also the air quality. Every quarter, every season is different. Uh, like a, a couple years, like two years uh, ago. When we had the drought, uh, the we issue a lot of no burn alerts because uh the drought actually makes the air worse. So we could have like uh, twenty or thirty no burn alerts um days, uh throughout the whole season from November first to the end of February. February, but in good season we may only have a few or less than ten. So I am thinking maybe this season is a pretty good one. I think we have less than 10 or around that uh, fake uh, number as of now. And we are almost done with this season uh, because of the rain and you know different reasons as well. So, uh, and well, we don't have the uh, 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 fireplace inspector. It's like, uh, it's like uh, the, the, the city uh, doesn't want you to use a lot of water. They don't have uh, the water police, right? Our inspector, we I mean we don't have that many inspectors to check on every household in the I mean during the no burn alert I mean no burn or check before you burn season, so basically we depend on uh neighbors so be nice to your neighbors <laughs> so usually neighbors report and um and then uh there are there are uh, um penalties if they I think the first time we use a warning. And uh, and then there are penalties uh, after that. So there are a whole lot of information here. And then we also have a program. I'm not sure if the funding is uh, already uh, gone. Uh, so for the residents to uh, uh, replace their wood burning fireplace with the um, uh, with a gas one. 
So uh, sometimes we make it an annual program. Sometimes, you know, the funding may be gone. So you may want to check if you're interested, you know, just check and then to see if the funding is still there. Okay, so this is about a check before you burn. And then we have different um, uh, clean air choices for the community, uh, like replacing uh, vehicles with clean versions, uh, electric car, uh, home charging. Um, so there are different ways for the community to um, to go green with all with, with all these programs, incentive programs. Now for businesses, for instance, uh, we have a cow moyer uh, program. Let's see if, um, let's see here. Here, this is a cow moyer, one of the major um, uh, funding program for the businesses. So we are accepting ap applications for businesses, uh, both public fees, private fees as well, um, to apply for zero emission infrastructure program. For instance, you know, to um, uh, the EV charger. Um, so this belongs to the infrastructure. So, uh, and uh, the application deadline is coming up on the 20th, they've extended it. So we have different programs for the businesses as well. Now, this is the Replace Your Ride program I mentioned earlier. Um, so, and then we're gonna change, uh, increase the incentive to up to $12,000 for zero emission replacement vehicles. And we are in the process of reviewing the contract from CARB, we got the money from the state. Um, so uh, yes, uh, so you can bookmark it and check it back to see when they're gonna increase it. I think it's about April, May timeframe. I'm not sure yet. Uh, my colleagues in the technology advancement office, they are working on it. Um, so if you wanted to know whether how much money you're going to get, you can go to check uh, eligibility and there's, um, uh, you can fill out the eligibility, your zip code, uh, the number of people in your household, your income, uh, and then what kind of car you're going to replace. And then you can check, you know, how much money you're going to get. Um, this one, I know also, uh, like even for college kids, um, they can apply to it, but then the car, it needs to be in the name uh, for at least one year. So, and then and we think, you know, this program is going to be, um, it's going to be uh, uh, valid for, for, for at least maybe a couple years. So it seems like we are adding money to this program. This is a popular program. So um, so there are different ways to, to apply for this program. So um, you can check your eligibility here. So this is a good program, very popular. And this is the program that I mentioned that you, know, you can also uh, uh, use this for e-bike and also uh, public transit as well public transit passes. And I mentioned that, you know, environmental justice is a big, uh, um, it's a big initiative for our agency. And uh, and then we underneath, you know, we have AB 617. These are the, uh, these are the community-based uh, programs that we um, try to uh, achieve emissions reductions in these uh, EJ community. Okay, so let me see, trying to um, close it here. You know what, I'm gonna use another method here, AP 617 and education. So we have an educational programs. Um, so the CAPES is uh, for elementary students and then WAM are for uh, high school students. So we have people go out to give presentations to students. Uh, we have the curriculum, the module. And then also we bring even the, uh, the small, the air quality um, uh, measurement for the students to help them um, uh, measure air quality, so it's quite fun. And then also we have other programs. I want to talk about. Um, let's say we have the um, 
governing board summer internship program. So we just announced last Friday that we are uh, accepting applications for uh, summer internship. And uh, so for college students or for uh, high school students, uh, if they are uh, over 18, and it's from June to August. Um, a good thing is that this is a paid, this is a paid internship program. So I remember it's a twenty dollars per hour, so it's not bad. So if you know anyone, so this is the application uh, website. You can just click on it, and then this is it. So uh, a governing board summer internship program. So twenty dollar per hour a, a day, and um. Is, is an eye-opening experience for them. And I think it looks good on their resume for students. So if you know um, uh, like your members have a co uh, college students or high school students over 18, encourage them to apply. And also I am going to show you the last few uh, web pages here. So all these uh, publications, you know, you can find uh, on our website and then you can subscribe as well. Uh, and uh, we have a newsletter called Advisor. This is by monthly. A lot of good information here. So you can find all our publications here as well. Um, and I wanted to show you. Okay, so we have lots of committee meetings, uh, a lot of advisor, advisory group meetings, and majority of them, almost all of them, they are made public. So if you go to our calendar, so every week you can find what kind of meetings we have. For instance, we need to, uh, um, our rulemaking process is long. It could be as long as like a couple of years because it's, it started from like a proposed uh, rule and then um, it has a whole public uh, process, public workshop, sometimes public hearing and a lot of different so all these we made public. You can just click the Zoom link and hear what we talk about, different rules. And then um, AB 617 and like last Friday. So, and then some of the uh, um, the committee meetings and advisory group meetings, they uh, are webcast. So if you go to our webcast, we just had our uh, governing board meeting last Friday. So you can click here and uh, and it's webcast. You can hear, you know, the whole, um, pro, uh, the whole board meeting. Uh, our legislative, our legislative committee meeting actually is coming up this Friday. So let let me go back. If you want to hear about what we talk about at the legislative committee, it's very easy. Just go to calendar. And I think you might be interested to know uh, what our legislative committee will. Just click on the link. So go to calendar and the legislative committee here, there's a link, you just click on it. So this is, all these are public meetings and you can hear what we talk about, what, what are the updates, you know, for our legislation. Um, and I think, you know, uh, I think Richard or some of you are here, you ask about um, the, uh, the, uh, the US EPA proposed uh, decision to disapprove our plan, I am sure that our legislative committee will talk about it on Friday. So click on it at nine o'clock on Friday, coming up Friday, you will hear the most, the updates. Because I I also will click on it to hear the updates as well. Yeah, so I'm sure they will, you know, at least, you know, uh, discuss about this uh, on Friday. So I would recommend you to click on it to, to hear about what, what the updates are. Um, okay, so, and I'm almost done. Uh, hope, hopefully it's not like um, information overload. <laughs> uh, okay, the last thing I wanna talk about, we, you can sign up um, for our different programs or, or um, items for, uh, to receive automatic uh, notifications. Um, for instance, um, for instance, for instance, incentive programs. If you wanted to know certain incentive programs, we always encourage cities and businesses to sign up and they will receive our, uh, our automatic notifications or even like technology or permit, um, different, different categories. Um, you can receive um, notifications as well. 
Okay, so uh, there, there is sea of information. Sometimes uh, college students call us, you know, to uh, for their environmental science projects. And then we walk them through because we have a lot of information on our website to help them as well. You probably, uh, you know, uh, are somewhat a kind of familiar with us, but uh, hopefully, you know, my presentation will bring you uh, some information you haven't heard about and hopefully you find it useful. So I am uh, available open to answer any questions if you have any. Richard's got his hand up. Go ahead. Yes, Richard. All right. Uh, here's another sort of detailed question, but it's sort of penetrating, just pushing down a little bit. Uh, the commit the uh, equipment exchange program really caught my eye. Uh, the city of Claremont just recently, within the past couple of days, sent a reminder to all residents that uh, gas fueled blowers, leaf blowers are not permitted that only electric, battery electric, um, or, or actually plug, but you know, for, for landscapers, the, the only option is, you know, to carry a battery pack and to uh, power your leaf blower with the battery pack. Do you have any real feedback on that program? I, I, every time I ask, um, a landscaper in the neighborhood or in the area, um, they say, oh, the, the batteries aren't there yet, that, uh, you know, they don't last long enough for them to get in a full day and blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm just curious as to what the perspective is of um, uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District in terms of the success of that program. You know what, we, we have... Uh, um... You know, my our uh, uh, vice chair Cacioli, he uh, he did a demonstration uh, when he did the presentation at the Claremont City Council meeting last year. Uh -huh. um, yes, it it is powerful. So the technology is there, and uh -huh. we yeah, the technology is there, and um, and uh, we we he did a demonstration of the uh, it's also quiet as well. So we, uh, he did a demonstration there, and I think he also um, uh, did a demonstration. He and then our consultant also did a demonstration separately with, um, um, uh, with with the uh, commercial gardens landscapers that attended the event as well. I remember, or maybe somewhere near Claremont. So he is an advocate for this program. And the, yes, the t technology is there. You know, the the feedback we receive have been pretty pretty well. You know, sometimes you know the um the uh the gardeners landscapers they have the old perception of like oh it's not working, <laughs> but it's not. So we need so that's why we need education. Yeah, we still have the funding, but we don't know how long the funding will will, will last. So we encourage encourage you know gardeners landscapers they make the use of it. And some cities they are uh, already banned um, the gasoline um, leaf blower. South Pasadena, I think Pasadena, I think Glendale is working on it, or maybe I have already banned. Um, yeah, so there, there, are, there are more and more cities they try to uh, ban the leaf blow, uh, the gasoline leaf blower. Thank you for this. I, I, you know, I'm sorry I missed that demonstration in the in the city council meeting. I'm embarrassed to say that I missed it, um, but that really helps. I will I will be a crusader now for that program. Yes, yes. Um, uh, it it is uh the I mean the technology is there and then the money is here. <laughs> It looks like yeah, Bob has his hand up, uh, Rainbow. Bob, did you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Just comment from my own personal experience. I have a C3 18 volt cordless blower. I use that regularly. It's nice and quiet, works very well. And it'll actually blow for about 10 minutes. And oh, unless, unless people have very large lots, which most Claremont people do not have, then that would be a perfectly reasonable increment of uh, power and time. But naturally, these are very compact lithium-ion batteries, 
And the landscapers who are in this business, it seems to me, uh, first of all, some of them should be using EVs rather than stinking old internal combustion engine, wretched old trucks that are the biggest polluters, even bigger than the uh, gasoline power leaf floors. But uh, <clears throat> it would be a very simple thing to have an inverter on board their vehicle to recharge those batteries when they're between, between jobs and they will recharge in about uh, 20 to 30 minutes. So there's no reasonable objection to using lithium ion powered blowers. I've used mine now for more than 10 years, I think 12 years, and it still works fine. It's never been replaced, no service. Happens to be a craftsman, but I'm sure many other <laughs> Leaf blowers are available, maybe more suitable for commercial service. So that's my comment about uh, cordless leaf blowers. Thank you for your comment. You know, uh, Bob has been using his for over 10 years and it still works. <laughs> and now the model, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the technology is even updated and also uh, the, the, the different models, updated models, uh, they suit uh, uh, better. I mean, they suit the needs of the commercial gardeners and landscapers. Yeah, I'll just echo what Bob said too. We, um, for some of our tree planting events, we got a auger, it's a battery powered auger. We did, I think, 44 trees on one charge uh, with a 60 volt Ryobi um, auger. And now um, a lot of the companies for the larger batteries will send you the regular uh, trickle charger and also a fast charger. So you can get, um, you know, three quarters, 50% of your um, battery recharged in like 20 minutes in a pinch. Um, so it's, you know, for us, it's been really helpful. I could see how if you're out there eight hours a day, every day, it could be a challenge to have that many batteries at hand, but um, the technology is definitely pretty amazing these days. Um, Rainbow, we're past eight o'clock, so I don't want to keep you any longer. Are there any other questions we could squeeze in, or I think we maybe have gotten to all of them. Um, if not, we could, we could follow up with you maybe, um, uh, in the coming days, but just wanted to, to thank you again for coming and showing us all those great resources. I know just seeing, um, what you presented that there's a lot of things that, that sustainable Claremont ought to be sharing, um, and our newsletters and on social, um, that could be really beneficial to the community. So super thankful for you coming on and, and I hope we stay in touch and, um, thank you everybody for coming out tonight and watching. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, so uh, any questions, just uh, send me an email, give me a call. And I'm so glad uh, uh, your group uh, has been so proactive. And uh, and I look forward to working with your group uh, closely in the near future. And thank you again. Have a nice evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>